Uh, what's up, everybody? Um, happy to be here today. Thankful to the FMC team for asking me to come be part of this and talk a little about commercial kitchens today. Um, also, just a quick housekeeping note, you know, just like all of you, I am, or many of you, I am sitting at home. Um, and so hopefully the dogs uh, don't go off. Um, I put my kids in charge of that because they're home for Good Friday. And uh, I also, uh, I unfortunately was in the direct path of the tornado outbreak. Uh, that took place in New Jersey uh, just on Saturday night. Um, most of the tree work on my end of the road has been completed. So hopefully the noise outside the house will be at a minimum. Um, but yeah, it was a, a pretty crazy experience. Uh, 110 mile per hour winds and a whole lot of damage to the house. Everybody is well and the house is livable. But uh, it's been a long week. I'd be lying if I said anything otherwise. Um, but anyway, we're here talking about commercial kitchens. Yeah, get this going here. And so, you know, what we're going to do is quickly cover an overview of commercial kitchens, uh, pests of importance. Uh, I'm going to show a quick case study of a mouse situation we were dealing with in a kitchen slash bar uh, in the Philadelphia market. Talk a little bit about that. Um, you know, in the end, it's funny, uh, you know, as a we mentioned or in the bio, it was mentioned that I now uh, am doing White Mantis Consultants. And what I'm doing with that is creating basically serving as a technical director for hire. Uh, a lot of companies are looking for technical help and training, uh, but don't want to hire somebody full time, which is totally understandable. And I'm coming in as, you know, a fractional part, you know, maybe five, ten thousand dollars a year, whatever it is, and, and coming in and helping develop training protocol, this, that and the other. And in doing that, what I've been doing is creating um, protocol cheat sheets. So like something you could provide to a technician with a front and back to it that is a quick overview of what they should be doing on that particular service, whatever it may be. And. What I've been doing with a lot of my clients is talking about pest protocols, but also talking about protocols for specific environments. And so commercial kitchens is obviously one of those. And in creating the process, what I've quickly realized is the environment, while something you need to take into account, isn't as important, in my opinion, as just going in and applying the fundamentals of the control of the given pest you're dealing with. And so listen, in the first 10 slides of today, we're going to talk a little bit about, you know, situations that are unique to commercial kitchens, whether it's communication chain, whatever the case may be. But once you get in to actually do the control, you know, the fundamentals of German cockroach control in residential houses carries over pretty well to commercial kitchens. You know, you're still, can, you know, taking into account all the same things, whether it's putting out enough bait, you know, whatever the case may be, we'll get into all that a little later. But the bottom line is, is the fundamentals are really about the pest more so than the environment. Um, and, you know, when we talk about implementing, you know, these programs, you know, this is a quote I actually found this morning, um, which is success is neither magical nor mysterious. It's all about applying basic fundamentals, you know, and a lot of what we do in life, there's parallels to um, I coach uh, two different my, my two kids travel soccer teams. I played soccer for 25 years. And I say to the boys in the team all the time, you know, they watch YouTube videos and they see these professional soccer players, you know, hitting shots from 35 yards out and, and doing these crazy spin moves with the ball and, and this, that, and the other. And they instantly want to emulate that. And I say to them all the time, you know, if we can just complete a 20 to 30 foot pass 99% of the time to the, your teammates' feet, and then just find the open space when we don't have the ball so that our teammates have somebody to pass to, we will win a ton of soccer games and looking very good doing it. Success is built on fundamentals. And that's no different in pest control. You know, and taking over a bunch of the accounts that we've been taking over with the pest control company we have in Philadelphia, what we're quickly finding out is that, you know, in some of the problem accounts that we've had, that we had, you know, complaining customers in the acquisition, it was really just going out, making sure that, let's say, for mice, bait boxes were properly deployed. They had actual bait inside of them, you know, shocking as that may seem. And a lot of those problems magically disappeared. And, you know, and, and also doing my consulting work and traveling around with a lot of companies. That is honestly what I'm seeing. I'm just seeing a, a poor execution of fundamentals. 
when you just start tying down basic things, following the label directions in regards to the deployment of whatever product you're using, making common sense decisions on where to put things and how to put them out, you know, corners of garages, whatever the case may be, very simple stuff. When you do these things and do them well, 95% of your problems or more will be solved. And so, you know, if you walk out of here with anything, this is the quote I want everybody walking out with, which is that, you know, I think a lot of times we overcomplicate a lot of what we do. And a lot of times what we see is that it's just the basic execution of fundamentals that actually makes most of the problems go away. And I think a lot of companies are at times poor at that. They're just not, they have people out in the field not doing the basics. And so again, we'll come back to this later. I can take questions on it later, but you know, this is a lot of what I'm seeing and experiencing in the field from both a consulting perspective and also a pest control perspective. So let's talk a little bit about commercial kitchens and the unique nature of them. Um, you know, we just actually had an account, like I was saying, in, in Philadelphia, and we were trying to do some commercial services during the day. And the client came to us and said, listen, could you guys come at night? It's just much easier for us. We don't have chaos in the kitchen, this, that, and the other. Um, and what we found was that, obviously, and I knew this was going to be the case. I needed my technician to understand this. And he's like, calls me up and he's like, man, this is so much easier since we went at night and there's nobody there. And so when you're talking about commercial kitchens, you need to be thinking about access, you know, when you can get in there and get in there and do a proper service in a, in a reasonable fashion. Um, one of the biggest challenges we face, and I'll get to this again in a slide or two, is honestly just cooperation from everybody. One of the biggest challenges is just communication. You know, we just have so many different people involved in these commercial kitchens that a lot of times, you know, one person is saying one thing, they're not you know, communicating whatever they're saying to us, to other people on the team. And there's just a constant breakdown of who's doing what and when and what people are saying and different people are seeing. And it just turns into a circus. Let's just say it like it is, um, or it can turn into a circus. And so that to me, you know, when we talk about the implementation of pest protocols in commercial kitchens, it's a lot, in my opinion, a lot less about the pests as it is about the people. Um, the people are the challenge you will face, and it's dealing with the people and trying to figure out ways you can do it in an efficient fashion. Obviously, food serving uh, surfaces and areas, so you need to be taking into account that you are in those environments. Uh, in commercial kitchens, it is typically a results-driven service, uh, meaning like you really actually need to solve problems. You know, you can't go in and, and, and not do the right things to get rid of the pest problems because in these environments, they can get shut down by health departments and other obstacles can they can encounter. And so we actually need to go in and make sure we're making a difference in regards to the pest activity. So we talked a little bit about the busy, uh, the, the, the pest control operating hours. You know, one of the things you wanna be thinking about with this is after hours or early services. Um, I know that seems uh, common sense, um, but where that becomes an issue is with your people. Uh, so the pest control professionals that are out doing the work, you know, one of the challenges that we're facing, which is a lot of the challenges I'm sure that the other owners on this call or, or operating managers are facing, which is that, you know, sometimes we struggle to find people that are willing to go at 6 a.m. or 8 p.m. Um, you know, we just had a technician just flat tell us, I'm not doing it. Like, I, I'm eight to five and that's what I'm doing and, and that's it. And so, I know, again, like I said, that seems very common, common sense in terms of after hour services, but it's not always easy operationally to implement. Um, the bottom line is, is you also need to be considering the cost to provide those after hour services. You know, you may need to offer overtime for that. You may need to offer and incent incentivize your people to actually go out and do those things, but it will make the service of these accounts much more efficient. Um, but, you know, the, the biggest issue, and this is to me is, is the biggest Thing that you will face when we talk about commercial kitchens it's revolving door of people um you know you just have so many people involved in these accounts and you have so few of them communicating with each other um you know you go and put out different devices and the cleaning crew has no clue what you're doing they come in and they remove all the devices you just put out six hours ago um you've got management telling you you need to do this and then you've got the the cooking line doing exact opposite of what you're at you've been asked to do by the management um, and so the bottom line is, and this is something that, in my opinion, you need to be communicating with your contact, which is that you anticipate massive communication chain issues, and we need to be talking about how we're going to communicate to everyone, so that way everybody is on the same page. 
Um, and I say that like it's going to be easy. It is not. <laughs> You're going to encounter constant issues with this. Um, but again, you need to be doing the best that you can. And honestly, we've actually walked away from accounts because of this issue where we have just had constant infighting within the team that we're trying to deliver the program. And, and we've literally, after several months of trying to solve the issues, just said, you know what, we're done. You know, like we just, we can't provide quality pest control in this environment with the current situation. You need to find another provider. Um, you know, it's not often that we do those things, but we are not scared to do those things when we are facing an uphill battle with the management company uh, and the team involved. So it's just something to keep in mind. You always need to be thinking about how you're going to handle this. I don't have any one great recommendation on how to do this. Um, you just have to have a willing client. You have to have a client that's willing to work with you and, and do the things you need to do to communicate properly. Um, and again, this just goes to what I just said, which is that you need to communicate uh, expectations very clearly. Um, the communication chain is absolutely critical. Um, <clears throat> placing different items in hard to reach areas so that, you know, obviously hard to reach, but still effective for what you're trying to do. Uh, so that way cleaning crews and stuff don't come in. You know, they come in and hose these environments down at the end of the day to clean them. And you've got glue boards on the floor. Well, those are destroyed now. Um, and so you need to be thinking about Whenever you're deploying stuff, always be thinking about what the cleaning crew is going to do after hours. Uh, and honestly, you know, this is a great tip for those that aren't, haven't done it before. Sometimes if you have a problem account or an account that's worth your extra time and, and effort, you know, going after hours, and I'm talking like midnight type stuff, for one night to evaluate truly what's going on after hours can really help you implement successful programs. We had a building here in New Jersey years ago that we went to, uh, they were dealing with a really bad American cockroach problem. And uh, we just couldn't get a grasp on it. You know, it was just a persistent issue. And we were dealing with some other issues with the account. And so we scheduled the time to be there literally from midnight to 3 a.m. Um, and we wanted to go out and see what the activity was after hours. And to be completely honest with you, it totally changed our perspective on the situation. We saw things that we would have never seen during the day, and it really gave us an indication as to the areas where the cockroach activity was coming from. Uh, not to mention, it also gave us the opportunity to see the cleaning crews at work, because that's typically when they're cleaning the environment. And it literally changed our entire approach to this account, because we saw things we would have never seen during the day. And so it's a great tip that I always give people is that, you know, I know, listen, that day is going to suck after you do that overnight service. You know, you're going to be getting a limited amount of sleep that night in terms of the work that needs to be done the next day, but it can really change how you see a situation. Uh, so something worth considering. Um, so what I want to do now is just kind of highlight some pests of importance uh, in these environments. Again, remember, it's all about the pests, in my opinion. We just talked about the, we'll call them environmental specific things you need to be thinking about in a commercial kitchen, the obstacles that you're going to encounter that are going to impact the service that you're delivering. But in the end, it's about the fundamentals with controlling these pests you see on the screen. Um, that is really the most important thing when we talk about commercial kitchens. And remember, this is a success-driven system. You have to actually be doing good pest control in commercial kitchens to grow in that, that, that vertical and, and be successful within it. And so what I wanna do as we go through this is I wanna just quickly highlight some of the basics about these pests. You know, I don't wanna go into like, you know, I am going to have a slide that says cockroaches are flat, but I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it. I just want to make sure everybody is kind of on the same page when we talk about the control and the things you need to be thinking about with these different pests. Um, and then, like I said, I want to show a case study at the end real quick that will highlight some of the things that I've talked about already. And so as we talked about, you know, with roaches, um, you know, they're dorso, dorso ventrally flattened, which is just a fancy way to say that they're flat. Uh, they're going to hide in cracks and crevices. We'll talk about that in a second. Um, you know, as far as the ID is concerned, you know, most people know what a German cockroach is. Occasionally, you'll see some other small cockroach species that get into commercial kitchens, um, but it, it's pretty rare. Uh, most of what you deal with in terms of cockroach issues are probably going to be Germans, Americans, and Orientals. Now, obviously, I'm sure I have some people on this call that are in Southern California or some sort of more tropical environment where maybe you do see other species that I'm not super familiar with up here in New Jersey. Uh, the brown banded cockroach is one that we used to see more, uh, definitely not seeing it as much as we used to. Um, 
but it is out there. You may occasionally get issues with it. Um, but most of what you deal with, especially with an interior infesting cockroach in a commercial kitchen is most likely going to be German cockroaches. You always wanna be thinking about thigmotaxis, um, which is the behavior of hiding in tight places where both sides are touching a surface. It's another fancy way to say that they like to be in cracks and crevices. Um, and so again, you always need to be thinking cracks and crevices. And as many of you know on this call, it's amazing how many cockroaches can be present in an environment, yet very little evidence be readily visible. Um, you know, I've gone into situations where, you know, we go through and we see some evidence of Germans and we're like, all right, you know, there's definitely something going on here. And then we come back when the population is more active and there's like hundreds of cockroaches everywhere. And you're like, man, it's crazy how many cockroaches can be present, yet not always super obvious that they're there. And that's because they're hiding in cracks and crevices. And so you always need to be thinking that way when you're deploying what you're doing. Um, we'll talk more about that in a second. Obviously, in commercial kitchens, now that's an American. Um, but in commercial kitchens, you always want to be thinking about the medical importance of these, these cockroaches. Um, you know, listen, they do have allergens associated with them. That's more of a topic, in my opinion, in affordable housing situations where you have massive amounts of cockroaches spread across entire communities. In commercial kitchens, the concern, of course, is the spread of pathogens through contact. Um, you know, that's why health inspectors are going to come in and, and start creating headaches because you've got an environment where cockroaches could be walking across a sewage line or whatever the case may be. And then all of a sudden they're walking across the counter where somebody's going to serve food the next morning. Uh, and that's how bad things can happen in regards to pathogens. Um, and so you always want to be thinking about that when we're talking about commercial kitchens. I'm not going to go through the life cycle. Um, this is all very basic stuff that I want to get into more detailed uh, information on the control of these different pests. Um, but obviously you have your adult male, your adult female. The one thing you always need to be thinking about though, and we'll get into this in a second, is that when the adult female is carrying that egg casing, German roaches, she is going to not feed very much. And that is one of the complicating factors of German cockroach control, which I will address when we get to the control section. Uh, so that Uothika is gonna have 30 to 40 eggs. Uh, the female will incubate them for about 28 days. Um, you know, all the basic stuff in regards to the development, um, but the development will depend heavily on temperature and food quality. And so I always get the question, you know, regardless of the pest that I'm talking about, how long does it take for whatever pest to get from egg to an adult? And honestly, like, I, I kind of hate the question because the answer is it depends. It depends on the situation. Now, in a commercial kitchen, your environmental variants are going to be more controlled, meaning that the temperature is going to be the same all the time. The food availability is probably going to be the same all the time. And so egg to adult is probably going to take the same amount of time, you know, every single day, every single month, whatever the case may be. But always keep in mind that depending upon the situation will depend upon how long it takes. You know, if you have poor food quality, if you're dealing with roaches in a cold environment, and I don't mean cold like a freezer, just chilly, um, that development may take longer, you know, and, and so you just want to always be keeping in mind that, listen, these are the averages, but they can change depending upon the situation you're in. So one of the most important things, and I'm a big, when I speak and I teach, you know, individuals, I don't go deep into basic fundamentals just because. To me, it's about identifying the biology and behavior aspects that directly impact what you're doing in an account. You know, I can sit here and tell you all about the science behind German cockroaches and, you know, all the different sensors on their bodies and this, that, and the other. But in the end, the technician in the field needs to know the facts that are going to impact what they're doing. And this is one of the facts that impact what they're doing, is that when that female is carrying around that egg casing, she is just to put it simply, she's not feeding. She's probably feeding a little bit, but she's not feeding a lot. That is a problem because if you go out on a you know day X and you apply whatever baits you're putting out, if she's carrying that egg casing for 28 days, she's going to go 28 days without feeding, which means everything that you did from a, a, a bait perspective is going to have little to no impact on those adult females. And so that's something you always need to be thinking about. Number one, how can we change that dynamic? 
And then number two, how often do we need to be scheduling follow-ups to be able to address that dynamic? And those are the things you need to be thinking about. And so one of the ways you can get the female to feed is by incorporating an IGR into the program. Now, one of the things I will tell you about IGRs, and this is a battle I just fought on the pest control front of the company that I own, which is that our technicians were using a lot of point source. Um, and I went out and said, all right, there's several different ways to apply IGRs, which is the best and most effective method to deploy an IGR for German cockroach control. Because obviously there's different price points. There's, there's all these different things that you need to be thinking about in terms of owning a company and implementing, you know, the different products you're using. And you know what I can tell you is that nobody knows, or at least I couldn't find anybody that knows in regards to what's the best method to deploy IGRs and what is the most effective way to do it. Is it mixing concentrate in a tank and applying it with a, a, a sprayer, a B&G, whatever one you're using? Is it using the point source we talked about before? You know, and then there's a million other ways, you, not a million, but there's a couple other ways that you can deploy these IGRs. And I can tell you that the research, as far as I could find, is not there. Um, and to me, that's a huge call to the academic groups to start looking at that um, because it's important. You know, it's important in regards to what we're doing. And so the bottom line is, though, so because I'm going to get a question at the end, it's going to say, well, which one do we use? And I'm going to tell you, I don't know, because I actually just went down this path myself and I couldn't find any good answers. And so the bottom line is, though, is you need to be incorporating an IGR into your German cockroach control, especially if it's a significant infestation, because it will stimulate the females to feed and will start to break down that cycle, which will help you get to control even faster. Uh, we'll talk about bait depletion and stuff in a second. So we talk about a German cockroach you know, inspection. Again, I know that this is a residential kitchen, right? But again, the concepts here are very similar to the concepts in a commercial kitchen. Yes, obviously the environment is slightly different, but all the same things. You know, you wanna be thinking about that biological vacuum, food and water. That is where cockroaches are typically going to be. Anywhere there's food and water. Um, so serving lines, you know, sinks, um, they wanna be close to food and water, uh, you know, and as those, those um, areas become overpopulated, the roaches will start to spread into other environments. Um, and if you went and it got rid of all the roaches under the sink today, by whatever, by a magic wand, all of the roaches that are outside of that environment will most likely then move into that environment. And that's the biological vacuum that I'm talking about, which is they want to be close to optimal locations and the easiest locations for them to exist. Honestly, and, and the analogy I use is, is humans. You know, if you look at the concentration of human population, it's typically close to cities or commercial or commercial areas because it's the most convenient to live. Now, a lot of us will say, listen, I want to live in the country because I don't want to be near people. And I hear you. But a lot of people want to be in cities. They want to be close to things to do and ease of access to grocery stores and all that stuff. And if I went and touched New York City with a magic wand and everybody magically disappeared, what would happen? The people that live in the suburbs would most likely move into the middle of the city. Same thing with German cockroaches. Um, they wanna be in those optimal locations. Always be thinking cracks and crevices when you're doing inspections and control. Um, look for feces because that is a fecal focal point. Anywhere you see cockroach droppings, there's an aggregation pheromone associated with it. It's also critical in the development of immature cockroaches for them to eat the feces as lovely as that is on a Friday morning. Um, but the bottom line is, is where you see the droppings is typically where you're going to find the populations. Um, again, this is uh, obviously, I know, a residential uh, refrigerator, but it doesn't make a difference because commercial appliances are all the same. Uh, not only do you have food associated with some of these environments, but you also have heat associated with them. And a lot of times cockroaches are going to be attracted to that heat in the motor units inside. What I will tell you about these is that you want to be very, I just take a step back for a second. I didn't want to go down labels in this presentation because it's not what it was intended to do. And, and also insanely boring on a Friday morning to talk about pesticide labels, but be very careful when you're treating these in regards to the labels of the products that you're using. Um, 
I just had a situation where I was consulting with a client and they were using a flushing agent uh, and the technician was out doing services on, you know, in, in cockroach environments and violating the label account after account after account um, in regards to where it can be applied. You know, it was a flushing agent. They were applying it into these environments and it was clearly labeled not to be applied in these environments. And so anytime you're dealing with appliances, you want to be paying attention to labels. A lot of times baits are probably going to be your most effective option in these situations. Use the movement of that fan to your advantage. So you're going to have air flowing in and out of these you can use your different IGRs uh, in relation to those fans to get the, the IGR moving. Um, and so there's different things you can be thinking about with this, but you always wanna be paying attention to the appliances. Monitors are also a great way to um, evaluate what's going on, not just before treatment, but also after treatment. And that's really what I'm gonna focus on in the next couple of slides is if you deploy um, monitors as part of you know, the evaluation of your control efforts, how do you use the information they're providing to tell them how well you're doing? Um, before I get to that, I want to talk quickly about attractants. And so this is a soapbox topic for me. I could literally create an entire hour presentation on attractants alone. Um, I'm not going to obviously do that today. But when we talk about roaches, you know, it's one of the most important things you need to be thinking about. You know, when we deploy monitors that don't have an attractant associated with them, they are then just random catch devices. And what we have seen in research, and it's not in this presentation, but I'll just quickly talk about it, is that in small Tupperware containers with hundreds of roaches in them, if a monitor is placed in that environment with no attractants on, it will catch around, and I think the data was two to three percent of the roaches that are in that Tupperware container overnight, over 24 hours. So think about that. Hundreds of roaches in a small Tupperware type container, a uh, glue board inside of it with no attractant, and over 24 hours that only caught two to 3% of those roaches. That's not good. The dynamic completely changes the minute you put an attractant on it. Now it's not just, I call them bumble traps where the insect just randomly bumbles into them. Um, you know, it's, it's an attractant that's drawing the roaches to the device. Now, as far as roach attractants are concerned, I will tell you that there's, there are a few good ones out there and you need to be thinking about incorporating them into your monitoring program. Uh, it just overcomes deployment issues as well. The research has also shown if your glue traps are pulled, unbaited glue traps are pulled even an inch away from the wall, Catch will go down significantly because, again, the roaches will just run behind it. And since there's no attractant associated with it, they're not going to encounter that trap. The minute you put an attractant in it, it diminishes that deployment issue. Um, also helps you overcome the cleaning crews moving your traps around. Now, even though there's an attractant with it, hopefully it will still work, even though it might have been moved. And there are cost effective options for cockroach attractants. So real quick, in terms of that glue trap, what I want to talk about is how to read glue traps after treatment. So you treated, you put out glue traps, you come back, let's say a week later, what do you learn by looking at those glue traps? Well, what you learn is how well you're doing. And so remember, and we'll just, I'll leave this slide up here and talk for a second. What stages of cockroaches are feeding versus not feeding? when we deploy a bait. We talked about it before. The adult females carrying egg sacs are not going to be feeding. Okay, fine. So once you deploy bait, if you come back and you find mid and late stage immatures and adult males, stages that should have been feeding aggressively when you deploy your bait, if you come back a week later and find them on glue traps, what does that tell you? It probably tells you you didn't deploy enough bait and there's still an active infestation. And so it's funny, I'll, I'll, I'll be working with a, a technician in the field and you know we'll go back to do a follow-up. A technician will see a glue trap like you see in front of you. And let's say there was a significant cockroach infestation earlier. They will say, oh, we're doing a great job. We're you know crashing the population. You're not wrong. You definitely improved it. But you're going to need to deploy more bait because these glue traps tell me 
that there's still an active infestation there. And if you don't deploy more bait, it's probably going to rebound because you have actively feeding stages of cockroaches on these traps. And it probably means you didn't deploy enough bait. As opposed to this glue trap, which to me says, yes, we still need to continue to deploy some bait and we still need to keep an eye on it. But I would much rather see this versus what I just showed you. Because what is this? This is an adult female that was carrying an egg casing. She probably wasn't feeding when we deployed the bait. Yes, we need to do a follow-up and yes, we need to deploy more bait. But this trap tells me we're going the right direction. That trap concerns me a little because you got active feeding stages. This trap, we're still gonna keep pushing, but I feel better about this trap. And so use what you see on your glue traps to help you determine where you're at with the program. And as far as treating roach issues, you know, I just wanna throw a couple slides up real quick here. Um, we talked about baits and IGRs. To me, that is the backbone of cockroach control. You know, you've probably seen Deanie talk, Deanie Miller or many other people. And, you know, they will tell you that in research, they have shown that they can eliminate significant roach infestations by just deploying cockroach baits. And I will tell you that traveling around the industry and consulting with many respectable companies, there are many companies out there where baits are still a third and fourth option. Um, and listen, that to me says everything you need to know. Um, Yes, you know, I, honestly, I would say in 95 to 98 percent of the accounts we're dealing with down in the Philadelphia market, we are not using anything other than baits and IGRs, and we are solving significant cockroach infestations. We do incorporate some knockdown components in bad infestations. I don't have the pictures in this slide, but we just dealt with an infestation of like a zillion roaches in a, a row home in Philly. That is one where we did deploy a liquid residual just because the numbers were so dramatic. We want to use something that's non-repellent, so that way we're you know not scattering roaches all over the place. Um, but we are not using anything repellent. We are not using flushing agents. We want things to come out. We don't want things to go deeper. Um, and so baits and IGRs are really the backbone of the program. And then the last thing I want to talk about when I travel around and I interact with a lot of companies, you know, and this is all Deanie's work and it's all great stuff. Um, to me, the biggest challenge that we face with German cockroach control today is bait depletion. Um, you know, I just was observing a technician with a company and I was watching them deploy bait and we went in and it was a pretty good infestation of cockroaches. It wasn't anything epic, but you know, it was a solid, a solid infestation. And I watched him put out about 15 small dabs of cockroach bait and walk out. And I was like, dude, those cockroaches are going to clean that bait out in about 10 seconds and you're going to have controlled maybe 5% of the population. You know, we need to make sure that when we deploy baits, we're deploying enough to control the infestation. And so the third bullet on this slide is literally what we built our entire German cockroach program off of, which is when you go in to do an initial service, for every 100 roaches you captured on glue boards over the course of two weeks, you need to deploy one tube of bait. Now, I am not telling you that you have to deploy monitors in every cockroach infestation for two weeks prior to application. Maybe do it in a couple just so the technicians can start to see how many cockroaches they catch on glue boards versus what they visually observe in that situation. And what you'll start to see is that cockroaches, I mean, cockroaches, technicians can get a good feel for how bad the infestation is on the visual inspection once they start to see how many cockroaches are being captured on those glue traps. Because deploying glue traps for two weeks prior to control of every situation is not realistic. But you can start to get a feel, you know what, I'm seeing droppings here, here, and here. I've got some active cockroaches scrambling here. I bet if I deployed monitors for two weeks prior to today, I bet I would have caught 300 roaches on them or whatever the case may be. All right, well, that tells me I probably need to deploy three tubes of bait. And that's the number you need to be thinking about. And so when we talk about deploying those monitors, they do need to have an attractant associated with them. But the bottom line is 100 roaches, one tube of bait. And that's what we're just constantly drilling into our technicians' heads. Um, very important. So what I want to do is transition into flies and rodents real quick. Um, I'm going to kind of blow through flies. I get what I did there. I didn't even do that intentionally. Blow flies, blow through flies. Anyway, 
Um, so listen, fly identification, I mean, excuse me, fly control is all about identification. Um, you know, I just had our technician call me the other day and said, I got flies in an account. I asked him what kind, and that is going to dictate everything you do moving forward. Um, if it's a large filth fly, like a house, bottle, flesh, whatever the case may be, a lot of times you're dealing with sanitation issues, open doors, um, you know, whatever the case may be, we'll get into it a little more in a second. If it's a smaller fly, is it a fruit fly, a forward fly, a drain fly? And, and each of those can, you know, I could do a two hour talk on flies alone, which obviously we're not going to do today. I'm going to focus mostly on roaches and rodents. Um, so that's why I said I kind of want to roll through flies pretty quickly. Um, but the bottom line is, is it depends on what you're dealing with. Uh, know that they can, some of them can transmit disease through contact with clean surfaces coming off of dirty surfaces, which I'm sure everybody's familiar with. Uh, and a lot of the control will revolve around sanitation and door maintenance. Um, as far as the large flies are concerned, again, it's a lot to do with sanitation and garbage maintenance. You know, it's funny, you get these, you know, kitchens that will call you up and they'll be like, we have a huge, you know, fly issue. We see blow flies flying all over the place and you go out there, all the doors are propped open and outside those doors, there's a dumpster right next to it. And it's like, you know, I wonder why we have fly issues here. And so a lot of times that has, you know, is, is what's going on there. You can look into air doors and curtains, which may help situations if they can't keep the doors closed. Um, you can consider fly lights and some pesticides in some situations. Just make sure you follow labels very carefully. You know, it's crazy. I was um, evaluating a fly bait the other day, and I believe the label said that you couldn't use it in kitchens. I was like, why are we using it then? Um, but anyway, so make sure you read your label very carefully um, and make sure you're, you know, again, to me, it's more about garbage cycles and doors being closed more than anything else when we talk about our large fly species. I'm not going to get deep in the fly lights. Um, this, again, could be a topic in and of itself. There are many different lights out there. Uh, I am not an expert on wavelengths and fly lights, and so I, am, I will admit I'm not the person to ask about which fly light to use and when. Um, one of the biggest challenges I have seen people run into, though, is putting flies in, set, in, in situations where instead of helping the problem, they're hurting it. We just had an account the other day in Philly where I went out to evaluate it. Another pest control company was doing the service, and they had the fly lights deployed, where instead of helping, they were actually pulling the flies into the areas of concern. Um, and so deployment of these is important, making sure that you're you know, attracting flies that are in the environment, but not drawing additional flies into the situation. Um, you know, and as far as baits and pesticides are concerned, um, you know, we've actually just deployed a bunch of Enzone in one account. Uh, there are a bunch of baits out there as well that you can consider. Again, just make sure you're reading all the labels carefully and make sure you're putting these products into the environments where they're going to work most effectively. Uh, we had a pool house where they were dealing with fly issues in this like spa type situation. And in the um, mechanical room where they were having some issues, the temperature might have been 947 degrees. Um, it was so hot in that room, but it changed what we could deploy because some of the, the temperature was not going to help or actually make some of these products not work the way that they're intended to work. And so you always need to also make sure you're paying attention to the environment and, and suitable for optimal impact. Small flies, um, I think I've cursed at fruit flies more than any other pest in my career. Um, fruit flies are just tough. You know, they can reproduce on such small sources of food. Uh, they can get into little nooks and crannies and be very difficult uh, to solve in especially uh, situations where sanitation is poor. Um, Watch for alternative type food sources. You know, there could be drain covers that are clogged with grime that they're feeding on. Um, I battle fruit flies in my own house that make me crazy. Um, and so the bottom line is, is, you know, small flies, again, I, I, this could be a whole presentation. I'm not gonna have time to go through them all today, uh, but it has a lot to do with sanitation, um, making sure that the drains aren't, you know, all gunked up uh, and the flies aren't feeding right there on the drain. Uh, the bottom picture was actually a picture we took in a dog resort, a uh, place that people would drop their dogs off for both short-term and long-term care. And, uh, you know, they were dealing with all kinds of pest issues. And I was like, have we moved these appliances in a long time? And they're like, no. And I was like, probably we should do that. And we pulled the, the refrigerators out and found uh, maybe 400 pounds of dog food underneath them. And they're like, 
why are we having these pest issues? I was like, I just can't imagine why we're here. Um, so anyway, so make sure you're moving appliances and, and cleaning thoroughly. So what I wanna do quickly now is talk about rodents and then I'll show the, the case study that I mentioned before. Um, when we talk about rodents, uh, I'm gonna kind of breeze through some of this, this basic stuff, obviously social, live in association with humans. Um, as far as the diseases are concerned, I know there's a question on your test that's gonna ask about diseases. Um, you know, hantavirus is the one you hear most commonly uh, referred to, especially with mouse droppings. Um, there's a bunch of others out there. I am not a disease expert. I can't speak knowledgeably about any of these. I know that they are very rare, um, but just know that they are out there. The house mouse, um, I think is taking over Philadelphia. I actually think house mice might win in the end. Um, they're present all over the U.S. Um, they are definitely a significant problem. The most eye-opening thing for me from a career perspective in the last year has been just how many house mice are out there. It's epic. Um, the bottom line is, is they're out there. There's a lot of them. Uh, they can reproduce indoors. And so that's what you always need to be thinking about when you're dealing with house mice. Um, a more common, I think, in my opinion, in urban situations, but will exist just about anywhere. Um, they can produce 35 young a year, can jump, uh, they can fit through holes as small as a dime, can go long periods of time without drinking water. Um, and a lot of times you will see them chewing on things to create their nests. Uh, we had, a, I'll show you the case study later, we had uh, the mouse population actually taking all of the wrappers off of the cans of food and using it to create nesting material. In regards to rats, um, obviously I'm not again going to go into this too deep, but uh, New York City, the, the real king of New York City is the Norway rat. Don't let anybody tell you anything else. Um, some of the rat things I've seen in New York have just been unbelievable. Um, they burrow. Uh, that's really the most important thing you need to think about with Norway rats. Uh, is you will find burrows wherever you're seeing rat activity. Um, they can fit through holes as small as a quarter. Um, again, they can get quite big. I'm not going to go into too much of the basics. They must have water by drinking it through moist food. Um, they can jump. I actually have had them swimming around my pool, so I can tell you firsthand that there are excellent swimmers. I live next to a farm, um, and so we do get a little rat population here and there, and uh, I have seen them swimming around my pool. It's quite impressive. Um, and these guys are killers, man. I, in New York City, I will tell you that they will eat pigeons. You will readily see pigeon bones outside of burrows. They will kill mice in situations where food isn't abundant. They'll even kill each other. Um, I've got pictures of, of dead rats that are literally just skeletons because the other rats have eaten all the meat off of them. So Norway rats are definitely aggressive. Here's just some pictures about uh, from New York City of, of Norway rat burrows. Um, again, very common in planters and stuff like that. And then, of course, garbage maintenance in New York is a huge issue. That's where most of the rat problems are, are emanating from is just people throwing bags of garbage on the street for garbage pickup. It sits there for 24 hours, and I wonder why there's a rat issue. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on roof rats. Uh, as I mentioned, I'm from New Jersey. We don't deal a lot with roof rats. Just know that the it, same things that you're doing for, for Norway rats at the ground, you have to typically be doing for roof rats up high. Um, as I mentioned, I'm not an expert on this particular topic. Um, they prefer aerial harbages, harborages. Um, the range of this rat, though, is more limited. South Central and Southeastern U.S. and along the entire West Coast is primarily where you see them. You will occasionally get a population here and there in, say, New Jersey or New York in the ports from them coming in on something, um, but it's not super common across the entire country. Obviously, rodents are going to hoard uh, different types of, of things. So you need to be thinking about this. At times, we actually just dealt with a residential home that... Um, the rats had actually in this residential, this woman was like fighting rats in her kitchen. Literally, I've never seen anything like this before. It was a residential home that literally had dozens of rats living in the walls um, to the point that they were literally just like standing in the middle of the kitchen, like during the day and like she was hitting them with brooms. It was crazy. But the bottom line is, is that they had a food source that they had hoarded all throughout the walls of this house. And that hoarded food was creating ongoing issues where we were putting baits out and all this other stuff. And the rats were not taking any of it because they had these food stores scattered throughout that they were using. And so always be thinking about that hoarding material. 
Um, as far as the droppings are concerned, um, you know, the picture on the right is a great picture in regards to what they look like. Obviously, Norway rats are much bigger than house mice, so you should be able to, in most instances, tell the droppings apart. Um, you know, age, obviously, too, you can tell as they dry out how old they might be. Um, I don't have a ton to add in regards to, to, to poop ID, um, but it is important. You do need to know what you're looking at. So how are they getting in? So when we talk about rodents, to me, it really revolves around exclusion work. Now, I appreciate that commercial situations are more complicated than residential. So obviously these are residential situations. Actually the pipes, the wires on the left-hand image, uh, well, that used to be there. The tree that came down due to the tornado I just got actually smashed all this, but that was what it looked like outside my house just a couple of days ago. And I can tell you that we were dealing with field mice, uh, you know, deer mice that were getting in the house and I sealed that wire chase and we never had another mouse in the house. And so, you can literally solve rodent issues through exclusion work. Uh, in commercial settings, door sweeps are huge. We were doing a warehouse situation the other day where I was walking through this warehouse and every single door had about an inch gap underneath it. You know, and I've been harping on the client to please fix the doors and install door sweeps. But the bot, and it's funny, man, door sweeps are such a huge topic in this industry. There's so many buildings that we deal with, commercial kitchens, you name it, where there's just a huge gap underneath these doors. And as long as that exists, everything's going to continually come in and out. And so exclusion is a huge topic. You know, as far as the products that you're using, you know, there's a lot of different things out there. I think I will always be a fan of Copper Mesh. Um handling excluder and that brillo -y type thing literally goes right through me. I can't, I can't even touch it. Like I literally get chills and gag. Um, but copper mesh, I can deal with all day. It doesn't really make a difference as long as you're deploying it in a sound fashion where you're really stuffing it into the gaps. If you're sealing cracks or crevices or whatever, um, both will work very well. Obviously, anytime you use steel though, no, it will rust. Um, and so you need to be paying attention to that. But exclusion is a huge part in being thorough with your exclusion work. Door sweeps, uh, I think this is door, uh, door seals, is what it says. Um, again, making sure you're, you know, putting out door sweeps in an effective fashion is super important. Um, you know, I already talked about it. I don't need to go on okay. anymore. But again, I do rec I, I recognize that, um, Exclusion work in commercial settings can be much more complicated. So I'm going to hold this topic till I get to the case study in a second. But I know that, you know, especially when you're in inner city environments, you know, exclusion can sometimes not be possible. But I'm going to show you in a second that while it's important, it's not the end all be all. When we talk about, you know, rodent control, please be aware that anything new in these rodent environments, they will be very cautious to. Um, we actually just had an account where we deployed all of our control efforts without without any of the traps being set. We wanted to gain confidence in the, the rodent population in regards to those traps. Um, they will become very shy of these if you have a significant population where some are getting snapped, but the trap is not actually catching the rodent. They learn very fast. And so you are, there are instances where you need to deploy these things baited, but not set to gain their confidence to then set them and trap the actual rodents. Uh, so just know that anything new in their environment, they will be very leery of. As far as snap traps are concerned, you know, it's really a, a company by company call in regards to which ones you use. I'm going to be honest, I'm a huge fan of the plastic traps. Um, you know, there has been research and anecdotal evidence that the more rodents you catch on these traps, the better they will work. Um, I also think the operational time it takes to set the plastic traps actually can overcome uh, the, the more inexpensive wood traps. They just take longer to set, especially for somebody who may not be quite as experienced. So I would consider the plastic traps uh, in regards to just operational time savings. Uh, but again, they are much more expensive. Case by case, company by company thing. I don't have one thing to tell you. Just I would be thinking about operational time when you're deploying snap traps. Uh, common baits to use for snap traps. Uh, I can't stress enough. Look at what the rodents are feeding in the environment and try to align what you're using to bait them with what they're feeding on in the environment. Uh, I'll speak more about this in a second when I get to the case study. 
Glue traps, I, I admit that, you know, when it comes to rodent control, yes, you can deploy glue traps. We will sometimes deploy glue, glue traps associated with snap traps. So that if they, the rodents go to avoid the snap traps, they sometimes jump into the glue traps. Um, but, you know, a lot of research has shown that glue traps are less effective than mechanical or snap traps due to the interaction between the whiskers and the glue. Uh, a lot of times when you deploy glue traps, you're going to trap uh, immature rodents rather than mature rodents due to the extended nature of their whiskers interacting with the glue. Again, I have no issues with people deploying glue traps, uh, especially as part of a program, but I do think there's probably better control options out there. Bait stations, um, you know, obviously these make up the heart of a lot of our rodent control. Um, I'm not going to go too deep into bait stations. I think everybody knows these are important. Follow the label um, in terms of how to deploy them and how frequently to deploy them. Um, obviously, always be careful where you're deploying these uh, in terms of access by dogs, cats, and kids. Um, but, you know, obviously, bait stations make up a, an important part of, of what we're doing. I will tell you that from our experiences in the Philadelphia market, the soft baits are largely outcompeting the other baits. Um, we are actually primarily and only using soft baits right now. And I actually have another company, a sizable company here in New Jersey that actually has just made the same switch. Uh, we're just not seeing a lot of feeding on block baits right now. Uh, they're not nearly as effective as the soft baits. Um, obviously, with some of the soft baits, you've got the paper that the bait is contained in. And that may not be right for certain settings like commercial kitchens. You know, obviously, as rodents feed on these baits, sometimes the paper will be pulled out and be left around the, the trap itself. You may not you know, like that in certain accounts and that's fine. Just know that though we are seeing significant, uh, significantly improved feeding on soft baits right now to the point that that's all that we're using. And so lastly, and then we'll take any last questions. I wanna just quickly blow through this case study because it's gonna kind of talk to everything I just spoke about. It should take me about two minutes and we'll wrap up. So this is a bar slash kitchen uh, in Philadelphia. It's you know right in the middle of the city. Um, it's not the nicest place in the world. Um, some of the stories that the owners told me, uh, I can't say in this webinar in regards to what goes on and the shenanigans that is involved in this place. Um, definitely would love to be there at 1 30 AM one night just to see the chaos that is going on in this place. Uh, but anyway, uh, we take the account over and there is a huge mouse. This is like a mouse party. Uh, we actually saw mouse mice running through the environment during the day while we were there. Uh, there had to be hundreds of there were mouse droppings on everything everywhere. Um, not sanitation was definitely an issue. They weren't cleaning very well. It's three floors, five bars, two kitchens. The building dates back to the early 1900s. So I'll show you pictures of that in a sec second. Over three dozen bait stations were noted scattered throughout, few with active bait and mice being seen everywhere. Um, basement had rat droppings in it. There was a history of roach activity, which we didn't have to deal with. And when we went in here, the health department was rumored to be inspecting in the coming weeks. So we had to do something and we had to do something quick. So this is what we saw in the basement. You can see the rat droppings on the left. The right, that is a sebum trail or so uh, a rub mark from the mice going in and out of that. Uh, you can see on the right hand picture that black, we'll call it a stripe. That is a hell of a mouse rub mark. Um, you know, a lot of times, you know, a lot of people will train technicians on sebum or, or, or rub marks from rodents. And I actually find that they're difficult to tell apart from normal just rub marks from mechanical equipment, especially for a new, newly hired technician. That was one you were not mistaking. Um, I can't imagine the amount of activity that it would cause to create that. This is the one kitchen. This is one of the oil fryers that they were making wings in while I was there. Uh, there is a massive amount of mouse droppings inside this oil fryer. The guy actually told me when I was there, he's like, yeah, I open that door all the time and two or three mice will jump out at me. And I'm like, great, let's have some wings, kids. Um, so what I will tell you though, with this picture, we put out a bunch of snap traps with different baits on it. We couldn't get anything to come to the snap traps. So we actually started baiting the snap traps with grease from the oil fryer. Uh, obviously not hot grease. We don't want to stick our fingers in the hot grease. But uh, we did find some cold grease, put it on the snap traps, and did have effect with that grease on the snap traps. 
This is the basement. Where do you start? Um, again, this building dates back to 1900s. Uh, it's quite old uh, and there was a lot of structural issues. You know, that's the loading dock door. We were never sealing. Um, lots of headaches with this account, right? So easy to get overwhelmed by the structural issues. We deployed bait stations following label recommendations. Uh, we were using one of the soft baits as our primary bait. Pair of snap pairs of snap traps were applicable. We set firm two week follow ups. We knew exclusion wasn't going to happen. Results. Um, bottom line is, is within two weeks, the owner said that they were seeing significant improvement in the problem. And then when we went back, so we read the, so within two weeks, I would say we deployed 80 soft bait packets throughout this bar, all within label. Almost all of them were gone. We came back in two weeks, we redeployed the bait, and on the next follow-up, we came back and we had feeding on about 10 of the bait packets. And now we hardly see any feeding in this bar and they're not seeing any more rodent issues. So it's amazing how much properly deployed bait stations and filled bait boxes can dramatically improve situations. Again, this was just an issue of poor pest control. Um, and it goes back to slide number three in this presentation, executing fundamental pest control practices will significantly improve a lot of what we do, no matter the environment. I know this is commercial kitchens, but it really doesn't make a difference. So commissions are really about the pest rather than the environment. Um, some unique obstacles to consider, which we talked about. It's more about managing people than pests. And always keep health departments in the back of your mind because in these situations you will run into some issues. All right, that's all she wrote. Jeff, thank you very much, and uh, I hope everyone has a yeah. relaxing weekend.